Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to the uh, this year new new experience for the Yocto project and Open Embedded Both at uh, ELC. So I mean, as everybody knows, this is the first time for everyone where this is going to be a virtual event. So I'm Nicholas Deschain, I'm the Yocto project community manager, and with me we have Philip Ballister. Philip. Hello. So. The both is always a very interesting exercise. Uh, so we are here as speakers, but really what we want to do is uh, we want people to ask questions and we want someone from the audience to actually answer the question. So, I mean, our job is to find questions and to find who can answer the questions. So we, we have started and we have prepared a few slides to just uh, get us started and get, the, get us warmed up. So we'll go quickly through these slides and hopefully uh, we'll have uh, questions um, so maybe there are a few things we have to say about the logistics. Uh, so there is the live chat. Um, I think, I mean, you can ask questions and you can raise your hands uh, if you want to talk or say something. And uh, we have uh, Jennifer from LF today that will help us and get you, put you on stage when, once you raise your hand. So we'll do our best uh, to use this tool. Um, I'm told this is, uh, we are the very first people to actually use it today. Um, so, if you raise your hand, uh, we'll give you uh, uh, we'll give you the mic at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah. And if you have anything, I mean, just ask in the live chat. We are Philip and I will try to keep an eye on the live chat as well. So, some project updates quickly. Um, we like to do that uh, since the last time last time we had the both, uh, which was at ELCE. Uh, we've made a, a number of releases. Uh, for the Yocto project, so I mean, you have all the numbers and all the values released, so we've been quite busy. Uh, the engineering team has been busy with people around the world. Uh, the one thing to actually really highlight, and I think and I hope we are going to talk about that today, is a 3.1, uh, which is the very first project LTS release, uh, finally, uh, which has been done in April. And um, yeah, so that's, I mean, one of the reasons why we ended up doing the LTS is because we've talked at, about the lack of LTS at many buffs before. So hopefully uh, we can talk about wow and what is being changed now that we have the LTS. So that's just to give you an idea about um, how we are busy and who are the developers and how many developers are actually contributing to the release. Uh, some also, uh, I mean, various updates about the project. Uh, so since the, the last time we talked, we, we had some uh, membership updates. Uh, you probably have all seen the news. Microsoft has joined uh, the project as Platinum, and we have two existing members who have updated uh, to Platinum, uh, Cisco and Xilinx. And also, uh, a few months ago, uh, AGL, uh, the Automotive Grade Linux, has, have, uh, has joined the project. And again, this is very important for us. Uh, the membership is actually what found uh, the project, and uh, they are also here to, they are involved in the day-to-day -day direction of the project, and that's uh, very important for us, and we welcome all, all our members. Um, it goes without saying, uh, the project is almost 10 years old, and uh, that's quite a milestone. So we'll talk about that, I mean, along the year. Uh, sadly, we are not all together uh, for this anniversary. But that's a, that's a serious milestone for the project, and, and we are happy about all the work done over the years, and hopefully uh, what's coming for the next 10 years. I think we talked about that a few times, but we have uh, some. Uh, we have Joseph, which who he is a very active uh, community member uh, from the Yocto project and Open Embedded, and he's doing uh, very often. I mean, once a month, once every few weeks, uh, some live coding sessions on uh, Twitch, which is like a video uh, streaming platform. If you don't know what it is, I encourage you to go and ping and find Joseph. He's here at ELC, he's probably here today. And uh, he's basically just uh, hanging out with his computer and doing something with uh, Open Embedded Yocto and showing, showing you how to, to do it and how to use it. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun and it's actually uh, being watched more and more. So I, I encourage you to have a look into these things. Last time we talked, uh, I think I mentioned that we were uh, moving the infrastructure side of all the list, mailing list for the Yocto project and the Open Embedded to gov.io. I'm happy to report that it's done. And uh, we don't have much to say because it just works and that's good. So now all the lists are hosted in Gov.io. Uh, finally, some question we have very often. Uh, people, I mean, want to start and they start with like a simple bug, uh, fix a simple thing and get something merged and upstream for the Yocto project for Open Embedded, any of them. 
of our project, we have a specific wiki page uh, with some entry point uh, for I mean, for people who really want to start and and contributing on small small bugs. Okay, um, a couple of more highlights. Uh, so the LTS, I'm not. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, there was a talk earlier today, and I mean it's been discussed, and I mean uh, hopefully many people know what they are, and I'm sure there will be questions. But uh, yeah, the Yocto project has its first LTS, which is great. Um, hash equivalence and reproducibility uh, have been enabled by default now, so uh, they have been uh, available for quite some time, but they were not enabled. So if you notice any change, if you find an issue with these things, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, to our community, and uh, we will work with you. Uh, but uh, yeah, each, I mean, so that it doesn't come as a surprise. It's actually something which is enabled by default. Uh, one more update: something with that a new uh, mini project that we've started. Or well, it's actually not mini at all. Um, we are in the process of doing a migration for uh, the Yocto uh, document, Yocto project documentation from what it is today, which is based on Docbook. Uh, and uh, we've chosen to move to Sphinx. It's been a, it's been a decision that has been approved by the, the Octo Project TSC. Uh, the migration is just starting now. So if you are interested in, and if you use the Octo Project documentation, like probably everyone out there, and if you like this documentation and want to contribute to the next uh, version of the documentation, feel free to join. Uh, there is a dedicated mailing list, a doc mailing list on the list of octoproject.org. And uh, there are many reasons why we do that. Uh, if there are any questions, we can probably deep dive into that. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, maintenance and what we want to do with the documentation, we felt it was actually the right time uh, to do the, the migration. Dip, you want to take this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Philip Ballister. I'm also on the Open Embedded Board. Um, which is basically the build system that got the whole Yocto project started. Um, and we hosted a workshop in February in Brussels the day after FOSDEM, um, and we had sponsorship from the Yocto project, so thank you, Nico. Um, we have recordings that should go live real soon now, and you can get a link to those from the URL on screen there, uh, which is also should be findable from the Open Embedded website. Um, and we had probably 20, 25 people there, and it was very well received, and we would like to do something similar again, because uh, it's very nice to have, you know, one day of just concentrated talks. So please talk to me about, you know, running this virtually unless, you know, the world improves dramatically in the next mm -hmm. few months. Um, we should think about doing one of these virtually to see how it goes. And I'm very interested in getting people to talk about what they're doing who are not normally presenting at things. This is a smaller environment, a little bit easier to get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. So we would like to get more people talking about their work. Uh, can we have the next slide, Nico? Um, this is the list of talks at this conference. And you've already missed the LTS talk that Nico did earlier. Um, and this is the BOF. And one that I would like to just call your attention to is uh, on Wednesday, Joshua Watt is going to talk about reproducible builds and hash equivalents, which uh, we touched on recently uh, on an earlier slide as something, some recent work in the project. OK, next slide. We are now actually running out of material. Yeah. Now it's so this is the interactive part of part of the BOF. And for the audience, um, one thing I always like to hear is what are we doing well and what can we do better, especially things that we haven't thought about. So this is sort of a throw it out to the audience and see if anyone has any questions. If you have questions, please type them into chat. So if, you, if, you, if you've been to the BOF before, I mean, you know how we like these things. Uh, we like any kind of questions. And they are in the room. I mean, I mean, I can recognize I mean, many developers from different places of the project. So we can hopefully answer lots of questions and any questions you have. If you've not done the BOF before, I mean, know that, I mean, uh, we will 
make sure that we find the right person to answer your question. Okay. Um. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get I mean, right. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm brand new to Yoxo and I want to start compiling OSs for ARM. Where should I start? Um, do we have anyone from ARM here who can answer that? Okay, what, what we can at least give the generic answer. So there are I mean, in the Yocto project documentation, uh, we have uh, the quick starter guide, which will guide you through actually running your first build. And you might choose to just build for ARM, uh, that's fine. And you will end up with something that can work in like a QMU, uh, I mean, a virtual platform that could be ARM or anything else. So, I mean, since you ask for ARM, especially, uh, there is an ARM community around Open Embedded and the Yocto project. There is a dedicated mailing list. It's called Beta ARM at, uh, at least.yocto.org. Uh, so feel free to join that list. And then if you have any questions or any specific ARM questions, you can ask them as well. Okay. And um, I'm still learning how this works. We have a special questions tab as well, uh, Nico. And I think Richard is going to have to answer this one. Uh, we have, uh, I have immensely enjoyed using BitBake, the build tool behind Yocto. I often like to use BitBake without Pocky. Is there a simpler way to use BitBake without OE, Pocky, INI? Well, I'm, I'm guessing that's meant to say Pocky, the, it'll be the open embedded build in its script. Uh, all that script does is just set some environmental variables. So if you don't want to use that, figure out what variables you need to set. It's usually, I think, BB path, and go from there. But you, you don't have to use oh. that script. Yes, OK. So if you look in uh, the top level of open embedded dash core, uh, and this is what I do all the time, there's uh, catch me afterwards, and I can tell you what the exact name of the script is and how it works. Um, yeah, good catch, Richard. I was thinking that he was running BitBake alone without any metadata because I overcomplicate everything. But that's possible too, but yeah. yeah. I knew, that's why I immediately thought of you because you know, that's the way it was designed to work. Um, okay, yeah, putting questions in the questions section is gonna work easier, I think, because I can't see it and the chat. Um, so when do we expect Yocto will support a read-only root FS with systemd? Do we have any systemd uh, gurus in the room who might be able to have an answer? Raise your hand. OK, let's skip that one and hope someone answers it. Um, Nika, we might need to take these and take them to chat afterwards as well. Um, so hopefully we can keep a list of the questions that we don't get good answers for. Um, so we also have a question, is CGL, meta CGL still being maintained? Does anyone know an answer to that? Well, there's, there's a couple of systemd ones, so I can quickly touch on those. Um, for the systemd read-only root FS, I think it's a question of somebody figuring out and sending patches. I think it works in some configurations but it's not perfect. So it, it is just a question of sending patches. There's also a question asking, is Sys5 in it going to be dropped in favor of systemd? Um, and there's probably a similar question where people are saying, are we going to make systemd the default? Um, to cover those ones, I know we've talked about this in the past boffs. Um, we were going to switch over to systemd as a default, but because of all of the changes it was just going to make to the testing matrix, it's actually made sense to keep system5 in it as the default have system D as the um, Pocky alt, conf alt uh, the alt distro, the alt, uh, the alternative testing configuration. And therefore, we test both equally now. And we have no plans to drop Sys5 in it at this point. Both have uses. Um, and yeah, no plans to drop it. So we've got a raised hand. That's Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy wants to, he's the maintainer for Meta CGL. Want to say something? Hey, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, can you okay? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Basically, I, uh, I'm the current maintainer. Uh, a couple of the other maintainers 
have been vectored off to other projects. Um, so they're not active as much, uh, but we are accepting patches. Uh, there have been there were patches that went in for Dunfall. Um, if you have if you have things that are that need to be fixed or updates, by all means send them in, and we will process them. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Okay, thank you. So I guess a question about Ninja. Um, so we actually lost Richard. So Richard, if you want to come back, you'll have to raise your hand again. Um, are there any plans to move uh, to Mason uh, Ninja as part of the default build mechanism? Richard, you want to take this one? Or oh, Ross, maybe? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. We can hear you. Um, and packages are being moved over to Ninja or Mason as a upstream move. Um, changing Obi-Core Yocto by default doesn't make any sense, but we are actively switching as upstream packages do for all the good reasons that everyone loves Mason. Okay, thank you. Can you take the next question, Nico? Do you have pointers on how to easily create bootloaders for custom boards that use ARM or RISC V? Um, so, do we have any uh, maintainer of baseboard layers who would like to raise their hands? No. Can, can we? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, can you repeat the question once again? Yeah, let me get back to the questions. Um, do you have any pointers to easily? I think the word easily is important. <laughs> <Get> bootloaders. <laughs> bootloaders for custom board that use ARM or RISC V. So, um, yeah, I think the bootloaders are basically primarily, you know, part of the SOC development rather Open embedded provides the environment for you to work with it, right? So, but we don't like have branches or any of that sort that you would want to do. However, we do have like at least for RISC V, there is Open um, SBI, right, which is uh, actually available in Meta RISC V. Uh, I think it is in the core now. Yeah, it is in uh, in the core metadata, so it is uh, kept up to date uh, to the latest releases. So. Um, but I think you have to participate in open SPI, you know, ecosystem to do the development and you could use a, you know, a Yocto project to build and test and basically it can be your um, build system. But I think from community aspect, I think the upstream respective upstream communities are where you want to participate. Okay. Uh, one question about PowerPC. Someone is asking what happened to PowerPC support and if it's gone. Richard, maybe you want to come back? Assuming you can. Okay, Ken, you're back. I don't know. Yeah, so the PowerPC question, right? So we still have uh, PowerPC in the core. So it's uh, still like PowerPC 64, for example, the support was added. And um, however, I think there is no, uh, what do you call like, uh, you know, default device or any supporting stock um, behind it that is being regularly tested. So, um, it's uh, also like a matter of someone supporting it and backing it and uh, making sure that, you know, it runs through all the tests and the auto builder uh, requirements for it to be maintained there. But um, it builds fine. I think as of now, I think from testing point of view is where you would have this drop. But um, if somebody is using it, supporting it, it is still there and uh, patches are still accepted. Um, if someone sends patches, Perspective to PowerPC. Okay, thank you, Cam. 
So we have a question, interesting question about license manifest. So I think we'll need you, Richard. Um, there is a, it's a hard process to collect all license information about the shipped open source packages. Uh, the generated license manifest is a good starting point, but the process of collecting the copyright holders for all packages is still manual. Yeah, um, it, well, uh, there's some tools in there that allow you to We are losing you, Richard. You can't hear me. Can now. I'll try again then. Yeah. Um, there's a layer, Meta SPDX scanner, which has some good tools in for handling a variety of different license situations. So that includes um, not just licenses, but also copyright information. So it, it takes some open source tools, some of them are in Fossology, some of them are in other repositories, pulls them together and then allows them to find things like copyright information. So ultimately, I'd love to see more integration with some of these things into uh, the core of the project. But for now, I would go and look at Meta SPDX Scanner and some of those tools, because there's definitely tools out there that can collect that information. Um, and I'm, I'm just not entirely sure which ones um, Meta SPDX Scanner is enabling right now. I think it does have copyright scanning in there, but if it doesn't, it should be easy to add using the sort of the process that's already there for licensing. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, do you have a question, Philippe, or should I continue? Uh, go ahead if you see one, I'll take the next one. Okay, so we have an ESDK SDK question, so prepare to raise your hand if you know the answer. Um, I don't understand uh, the workflow of bringing artifacts produced by teams using ESDK into my final image. Where is the best place to get more information about that? I would like someone to raise a hand now. I was hoping Paul would be here for that one. Make sure he's back. I'm, I'm not back, I never left. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think I, I figured I get removed as soon as somebody else raises their hand, I think. Do you want to answer this question or? I can certainly have a try. I mean, br bringing back in artifacts is usually a question of writing the recipe to then go and build code um, or the standard model of, you know, contributing into a shared estate cache and working that way. Um, it is sort of it is the same sort of step as you would normally use for bringing things back into a normal build, which can then inject them back into an ESDK. It's sort of designed to be circular. Right? I am a little bit disappointed we haven't been able to develop ESDK further than we have. I think there's some good ideas in there. Equally, there's some things that you know both Paul and I uh, would do differently um, given the experiences that we've had, and we, there's ways we'd like to improve it. So if people are looking at that, I think it, it's something that probably needs a little bit more work on its developer workflows. I think the ideas are good, but um, yeah, it's unfortunately the, the people originally working on that have been moved on to other things and there isn't really development going on. So it, it would be great if, if a new sort of generation of people wanted to step forward and figure out where to take that. That would be awesome. Okay, can you go? I lost the window. I can. Uh, please find it again. Um, is there a recommended tutorial in regards to creating a Jenkins uh, configuration file and setting up a pipeline? Um, so that's a good question. So we can see if anyone, I mean, there, I mean, as probably everybody knows, I mean, there is not one way to actually build or with OpenMBD or build with Yocto. I mean, everybody has more or less their own ways. So that's why you're difficult questions. Uh, what I wanted to say before we can ask the audience is that there is a talk on the, on the Yocto Project Dev Day on Thursday on how to actually do CI CD uh, with the Yocto Project in GitLab. I mean, it's not Jenkins, but I mean, it's, it's a hot topic. It's something that many people do on their own way. And we actually wanted to uh, show uh, one of our committee members on how to do that with GitLab. Uh, can someone, someone has anything to say about Jenkins and Open Embedded? I've done it, but in very brute force manner. Yeah, so um, I gave a talk at 
Edinburgh, I think, on uh, living on master building with with Jenkins and, and keeping everything together. So it, it's definitely very doable. Um, the Jenkins itself is a bit complicated, but in terms of pipelines, uh, you know, I would recommend um, you know looking at the Groovy scripting language and um, and doing your builds that way. We uh, we were building at that time using uh, the Pocky container from Crops. So all of our builds were done in, in Pocky, um, or sorry, in the container, in Docker containers. Um, there were some gotchas in that regard in terms of number of file nodes and things like that that could get in the way. These days, I would probably look at Pyrex, um, which basically wraps all your bit bit calls with a container call. But if you have any other specific questions, uh, ping me or come to the booth and I can try to share more. And someone puts in the comments that they experiment with Jenkins and GitLab CI and found GitLab CI slightly simpler to use. And we've got a couple hands up or a hand up. David, you're on. Yes, I just, as I added a chat, to the question about ESDKs, um, there is a tool in there to export your custom content to a layer. And once it's in a layer, then it can go anywhere you want it to do in like the Arctic project. So that's a general solution. And I also added Paul Eagleton, the author, he'll be at Dev Day. So if you want to see him, he's also been haunting the booth. So check him out there at our Slack, but he'll be at Dev Day if you want to ask specific questions. So we'll be talking about Dev tool in general. Thank you. We have another hand. Make a nod. Okay, uh, you can hear me now? I just cut out for a second there. Yeah, I just wanted to say regarding the Jenkins, uh, I work for Wind River and I've been experimenting, um, I guess, the last three years with Jenkins and Docker Swarm. And I put some stuff up on uh, our open source labs uh, page for creating, um, for doing builds, uh, doing Wind River Linux builds, but it should be fairly, uh, the only, should be uh, a lot of that stuff is relevant for building Yocto. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of that stuff um, in the dev days uh, as well. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm trying to move away from Jenkins personally. Um, I'm looking at Kubernetes and Tekton and other things, but if you're interested in those sort of details, I'm happy to talk, have to talk about them. Okay. Okay, thank you, Bernard. Um, I've got a question here. Are there any interesting tools using the tinfoil API to BitBake internally or public? Uh, did we lose Richard again? Lots of tools, say so Ah, uh, so team say dev tool. Oh, Richard is back. You're on. In foil inside. Um, those are good places to start. Um, people are starting to use it in other places. Um, I can't think of any other big public tools, but. Uh, yeah, those, those, are, those are good places to start. Okay, so there's some usage apparently. Um, I had another one. I don't know what this question means. So I'm just kind of curious if anyone out here can help. Is there a group of people who want to focus on support for FTPM or physical support? This may also benefit from a read-only root file system. Anyone have any ideas? Oh, do we need any clarification for the question? All right, uh, it was kind of a fishing expedition, I guess. I mean, you guys are definitely can ask us questions we don't know the answer to, but that doesn't mean that there's not people working on it, um, because we see an incredible diversity of. Uh, of use cases for this, some of which um, we've never thought of in our entire lives. Uh, so this is an easier one, I hope. 
Are there any plans for Yocto to support fetching build artifacts from sources like Artifactory or Conan? Oh, this is interesting. Well, I'm still here. I've heard people asking about that before. It should be possible by doing that as a fetcher module. Um, but I've, I've not seen anybody submit patches for it yet. And I don't have access to such things myself, so I'm probably unlikely to do it. But the, 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 code, the ability is definitely there in the code base uh, to add in the modules for it. So Conan is for building binaries. I saw a talk on this at Fosdom. So this is, it sounds like they want to fetch binaries built in another system and then build packages. I mean, definitely, if we don't have good answers for your questions, we'll be around the chat um, for the rest of the week. I can see a question. Hello? Uh, oh, yeah. you would say something, Joseph? Oh. Um, I would just like to add that uh, there was an example implementation of a Conan fetcher a couple of weeks or months back on the mailing list. And Paul Barker, who unfortunately isn't with us today, uh, had severe um, questions or concerns about uh, the licensing problems with it because you basically pull binary artifacts without any uh, proper licensing information from somewhere in the cloud and pull them into your uh, build. So unless the Conan folks actually get their stuff sorted out first, we cannot properly do this. Yeah, so on Artifactory, I think, um, you know, the setups are very proprietary, or at least that's what I've seen. So there are fetchers that are around, but uh, they are specific to implementations because how you set up the Artifactory and it has like exchange of credentials and things like that. Um, you can say that it can be done in a more like generic fashion and then the authentication part could be separated out. Um, but uh, we haven't done that. But um, yeah, so far, haven't felt that it would be a generic solution that would be appropriate in the core or elsewhere. Um, so that's what I wanted to mention for Artifactory. And we've got one more hand. No, the hand went down. The hand no, came back. I think it was me. And you disappeared again. Um, while we're waiting, let's uh, do this question. I'm just starting to learn about Yocto. Does it support LUKS encryption for mounted file systems? I know I've seen some talks about encryption for file systems, and I, I want to say there's one in the Open Embedded Workshop, but I'm not sure if it's that specific encryption. Yeah, you know, so Lux was one of the things that was supported by Intel IoT Rec Kit. I mean, I realize it's a couple of years old now, but um, if you go look for that, I can put, I'll post the link into the chat. Um, that was supported there. And also there's um, some references on like NXP's um, community board about doing Lux encryption and so on. So it's, it's definitely supported. It's just a matter of... Uh, setting up your configuration properly. And then the devil's always in the details in terms of what specifically uh, your build system, what, what you're ending up building with your images, you know. So, but Lux is definitely supported, definitely work. Okay, I saw a question about the HCP. No, I don't see the question anymore. Uh, but someone was asking about the deprecation of the ISC, the HCP, which I think I've been, I've seen discussed on the mailing list or ISC, like uh, this week or last last week. Also, Richard, you want to explain what's going to happen with the HCP?
Right. Come on, guys. Feel free to jump in if we... Uh... All right. I'm flipping through all the questions. Anybody else wants to take? Also, I think you were discussing the DHCP. Do you want to answer this question? Okay, so there is the answer. That's what I thought. But the, yeah, it's going to, the answer is yes. It's going to be replaced with Kia. Um, and it's going to happen on master soon. So the next question I see that we haven't touched on, is anyone having success with SE Linux labels on R0 root file system? Is significant work is significant work policy work required to enable SE Linux? And these are the questions where we need help from the audience. Okay, so we have a hand up. Hand down. And once again, please feel free to ask in chat afterwards um, in case people are having trouble with the platform. So I see Bruce and Mark answering the question. Do you guys want to take the mic for a minute? Oh, Mark, you had that. Yeah, I'll just talk briefly. Um, I, I was a maintainer for MetaSE Linux. I may still be in the maintainer file, but I've had no time in a while. But um, generally speaking, the expectation is that the SE Linux infrastructure, the support for the labeling, all of that's supposed to continue to work. It's really down to the policy. Um, there is no standard policy. So that is something that you'll have to develop yourself. And it is not easy to do. So keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so just looking at the time, 37, 38 minutes. So we have some more time. So hopefully more questions will come. Yeah, what's happening, Nico, is the guys in chat are sort of answering the questions without opening their microphones. And if we're looking at the question list, we can't see them chatting. Um, are you saying that they don't need us? Um, th they're bypassing the system and making it a little bit tricky for us because we think nothing's happening and something is. Uh, so who has their hand up? Joseph. Hey, Joseph. Yeah. Hey. Hi, Nico. Uh, I, I would like to um, to repeat a question from uh, the YPDD in Lyon, actually. Um, the question was, is there anybody here actually doing this for fun or as a hobbyist or are we all like um, doing this as professionals just to earn a living because that's that's kind of like it's interesting whom we are actually working with that's a very good question i see hands raised yeah so um this bill is very much a hobby for me, and I'm very—I mean, I do a lot of stuff on my own time that has absolutely nothing to do with my my employer, but it's also my day job. So it's, it's a lot of both, and I think many of us actually fall into that camp. Most of us probably had more time when we were earlier in our careers and experimented more, did more hobbyist type things, and just as life goes on, it, you tend to get busier and busier and less of that time, but. Um, yeah, so you know, I was working on 3D printer stuff and other things in the maker space, and I still have a lot of interest in like home automation and things like that, like home assistant. Uh, but it's just a matter of time. Oh well, yeah, so so I wanted to say I use it in both um, realms. So I have my home automation that is you know, that's where I experiment quite a lot and stuff. That um, where I use you know like Raspberry Pi as a gateway for my sprinklers and uh, for my wash machine and stuff. So I keep tinkering this stuff. That's I use it for that. And professionally, also I use the project in a separate uh, realm of things. And um, uh, and also I have been trusting other architectures that doesn't uh, matter professionally to my employer, for example. And you know, so I keep on those and I use the project for doing that now.
Okay, I can see an interesting question here. Is there any uh, support for building an asymmetric multiprocessing SOC? And if so, is that uh, supported with uh, RunQMU? Um, so I want to take this one, and I guess we probably need to define asymmetric here, but I'm going to assume it's like SOC with various cores from different, even different architecture maybe. Anybody wants to talk about that? Maybe multi-config? Yeah, We've sure, got two hands up. Hey, uh, yeah, so you, you can do um, heterogeneous computing with multi-config where you can compile different parts of the system for different architectures even. So that would be like your main cores or ARM and your secondary cores or AVRs or whatever you want. Um, it, it doesn't need a little bit of work to get those tool chains set up, but uh, that is definitely supported. That was a great talk uh, from Microsoft. I think it was ELC last year, maybe ELC last year. And they explain how they actually build and use multi-config to build the a asymmetric systems uh, for the Azure sphere. So you might want to watch what they've done. Uh, they did share like a lot of good uh, tips and tricks about what they learned in the process. So I think the part of the question was on QEMU. Um, and QEMU itself, I don't think like you can have same emulation in the same process. So I mean, I mean different CPUs being emulated in the same process. Uh, it would be easy if that was the case, but um, I guess you know you have to like really look into how to set up multiple QEMU instances perhaps to run it. But as far as building it concerned, I think uh, your project is well set for that. Okay. Um, yeah, QMU mainline can't do that. Some vendors have their own support. Okay, I think we got most of that. Okay. So is there any questions that we have missed? Thank you for liking my cat. I don't know what the sort order is on these cats. How, who gives the questions thumbs up, by the way? Yeah, users, every, anybody can have both questions and that actually change the order and the sorting. Yeah, we're learning a lot today. Okay, the attendees. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, so do you have more questions? Uh, we have a question maybe for you, Jennifer. Is the audio uh, going to be available after? Yeah, Richard, I asked this question. And uh, so I think, Jennifer, we have two questions for you. Uh, is the chat and the questions going to be recorded somewhere? And is this uh, live, going, the video, going to be available? Okay, it would be a uh, video would be on YouTube. Okay, do you know if we'll have the chat available? Well, I think given the circumstance, it was not too bad. We probably had more questions than we usually have at the both. So I mean, the platform has been almost working fine, except with you, which I'm sorry about that. Any, uh, any more questions?
Okay, and if we have any, you know, follow-up questions, we have the, uh, the, the channel on Slack, and uh, most of us should be around this week to help answer questions and try and clarify anything we didn't do. Um, oh, here we have a good question um, in chat. What can companies do to help the project? So that's a very interesting question. So there are many different answers. Um, I mean, the first and obvious one is actually to go and join the project, the Yocto project that will actually provide resources and, and help set the directions for I mean, the Yocto project and open embedded technologies. I mean, that one is obvious. Uh, but uh, I mean, obviously, uh, having your engineers uh, contribute to the project, I and mean, you don't have to be a member to actually contribute and send patches. So definitely contribute to your use case. Um, I mean, sending badges is one thing, but also what we what we figure out, and especially in this bar, we are meeting users of the project that we don't talk to in general. And sometimes you guys do things that we didn't think about, so we don't know all the use cases. So sharing your use case with us, joining the mailing list, um, and sending patches, I mean, obviously, uh, is, is something. Um, reporting bugs, uh, testing master. I mean, now that we have the LTS, I mean, contributing to the LTS is also something, things that I mean, company can do. Very often we see that, and, and we hear that when we actually go, I mean, to events. People just go and they git clone this thing and they go and they use it and they don't necessarily contribute. Even if they fix issues sometimes, I mean, they just fix issues on their own and don't send back. So just contributing back the fixes and the improvements you do on your on your side, I mean, would be a tremendous help. Oh, test cases, yes, testing, uh, that's a good thing. Um, we are relying more and more on automation for testing. Like, I mean, I, I think we gave some numbers, but we run all, close to 2 million of tests when we actually do a full test and it's all automated. So it's it's many tests, I mean, self-test for the system, but also I mean, P-test for the recipes. So, and more testing I mean, that we have means that we can catch issues more often and, and quicker. So that's that's always good. So testing things in such a way that we don't test them ourselves would be nice. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to say test tool is available for anyone to run tests on their environment and report back the results. Um, so I think that would be a great help if, you know, if people have their devices perhaps that they can you know, offer. Uh, as they test, or you know, they can run tests on and report back, perhaps um, that'll be helpful. And um, participation generally, you know, not only in code but also otherwise, if you have resources, or you know, there are various other aspects of project, you know, starting from marketing and and documentation, you know, non-technical um, aspects of project as well, uh, documentation perhaps, you know, that you can help there as well. So. Obviously, letting your engineers work upstream you know, is is um, one big way to, to contribute and also influence the project. All right, and I mean there are many good uh, suggestions from Richard, so I hope you get them. Uh, but helping us, uh, Randy. Um, another thing that people can do is um, sign up and uh, to work on some bugs that are listed in the bugzilla. And uh, if you're also interested, uh, you can participate in the bug triage, which happens every Thursday. Okay, your audio was a bit bad. A bit bad. Thanks for me. Can, can we move to you, Randy? I'll try to repeat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Sorry, Randy. But um, yeah, so the Bugzilla, uh, I should mention that. Uh, Bugzilla is the, the, the bug system we use. So every, I mean, most of the change we do, we try to use Bugzilla. So if you can also have your engineers report issues and help us on Bugzilla, uh, would be uh, something. On the day-to-day, -day, um, if you talk to Richard on the day-to-day, -day, I mean, there are issues every day that just come and pop. Um, so there are two meetings uh, every week where uh, the team, uh, the, the community comes together. I mean, there is the technical meeting where they talk about I mean, the stages of the project and what's going on and what's going to be worked on. And there is a triage, bug triage meeting where, I mean, people can join and help basically looking at Bugzilla and, and finding what are the real issues and doing some bug triage. So again, I mean, you don't have to send patches. You don't have to be a member to do all these things. I mean, you can, I mean, you can help the project in many different ways. 
Let me have a look. Right, there is a new testing manual, which has actually been written like a week ago, finalized a week ago. So if you want to help, if you want to run the same test that the project is actually running, uh, it's actually now a very well documented process. Uh, we got a couple more questions if I can find them. I see a few things about Microsoft. They actually have made a few talks and, exp and they explain what they what they do with the Yocto project and why they use it. So that can give you some hints about um, why they've joined. I think I linked one of them as one of the answers. Ah, oh, someone. Put a little notification. There was more questions. Someone is asking if we can replace Bugzilla with something better. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, if Richard if you want to say something about this one. What's better these days? That's sort of a general question. Don't mention closed source software. All right, there may have been some questions, but I can't find them. Ooh. So as I just said, there is a migration of Bugzilla uh, to a new uh, version, which is planned for the short term. Any questions on the question tabs? So Paul Barker has a GitLab instance running. Um, if people want to play with that, uh, someone mentioned GitLab. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, this is uh, we have GitLab.com slash open embedded. If you don't find it, ask, ask me offline and I can point you. Um, that's a place. I mean, some people have asked for like hosting open embedded layers on GitLab. So we set up uh, the main uh, namespace for OpenMBD there. So anybody is actually free to come to us and ask, I mean, and we would just make a new project. And if they want to experiment with using GitLab for the layers, um, that's possible to do that on the OpenMBD uh, GitLab. Yeah, and I, uh, when I set up the MetaPython 2 layer, I had to do it with automation and I used GitLab CI for that. So I posted that link in earlier, but if anybody has any questions about the approach that I took to that. I mean, I mostly copied some stuff actually from, uh, oh, I'm forgetting his name now, but a guy over in, uh, in Siemens. Um, but um, yeah, it, Lab CI definitely is um, fully functional, especially with things like the class Docker container. And, um, and we also use it you know, a fair amount uh, at work, but moving the entire project to that, it's just, there's a lot of decisions to be made in terms of switching from a tool like Bugzilla to another tool. Okay, Tim. Thank you all for coming. Any final words, Nico? Uh, yeah, I mean, thanks everyone. Thanks for using this uh, platform and uh, having us today. Thank you. And again, we are going to be on Slack for the rest mm -hmm. of the week. And we are on the mailing list on IRC, I mean, for the rest of the year. Uh, we also have a, a Yocto Slack channel um, as well as the embedded one, but most of us watch both of them. Yeah, that's that's not the Yocto Slack. We are actually using the conference main Slack server, and we have a channel there. We usually don't use Slack. I mean, it's actually a good question whether we should have one uh, that we can maybe discuss. No, no that's closed source or, or something similar. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Okay, so thanks everyone, wherever you are. I mean, have a good uh, rest of the day, a good morning, good afternoon, good night, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye-bye.